Many years of cruising around the world on their 44-foot yacht Mai Tai, Kay and Lane Finley have visited many beautiful and exotic places. <laughs> Hundreds of cruising yachts sailing westward across the Pacific head south to New Zealand each year. They come here to escape the tropical cyclones which blow through the South Pacific Islands over summer. The Pacific Ocean covers more than one third of the planet's surface and is dotted with thousands of islands. Polynesians travelled all over the Pacific in their open twin-hulled canoes, settling islands along the way. They first arrived in New Zealand over 1,000 years ago and named it Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud. After Captain Cook's first visit to New Zealand in 1769, sailing ships began to arrive, bringing European merchants and traders keen to settle this new land. Kay and Lane are going to explore this wonderful cruising ground. They'll begin their voyage in the north, where, with its temperate climate, there are hundreds of safe, protected anchorages throughout the numerous bays and islands. In Fiordland, they'll experience some of the most remote and unspoiled areas of the world. Further south, they'll sail Mai Tai down into the Southern Ocean, around the bottom of Stewart Island, before heading northward again to Banks Peninsula, the Marlborough Sounds, and finishing this trip in the city of Nelson. and invite you on board Mai Tai to join them on this voyage of discovery of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Kay and Lane begin this voyage in the Hauraki Gulf They'll sail around and explore some of the islands of the Gulf, which are all within close proximity to each other, yet are so very different. Over on the Coromandel Peninsula, they'll take a hike up into the hills to visit an old Kauri dam. Then, back on the mainland, they'll sail far up an estuary to see where the European immigrants first settled. New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, with a population of 1.5 million, lies on the Waitemata Harbour in the southwestern corner of the Hauraki Gulf. Within this protected cruising ground of over 1,200 square nautical miles lie numerous islands and hundreds of beautiful anchorages, all within a day's sail from anywhere in the region. This region has nine marinas, totaling nearly 5,000 berths and the facilities are really excellent. Auckland has been called the city of sails, as there are more boats per capita here than anywhere else in the world. It was a beautiful day that we chose to leave Auckland to sail to Waiheke Island, our first island stopover. We enjoyed a great sail past the volcanic island of Rangitoto, which is the familiar symbol of the Hauraki Gulf. The island of Waiheke, with a population of 8,000, is just 13 miles from downtown Auckland. Many of the island's residents commute daily to the city to work. Just a 35-minute ferry trip allows them to return each evening to the peaceful island lifestyle. Some excellent wines are produced on the island and there are several superb venues like here at Mudbrick Cafe where you can book in for a special occasion 
or simply take a coffee while enjoying the magnificent setting. Oni Roa is the main town overlooking the beach on the northern side of the island. For many years, artists and musicians have made Waiheke their home, and you can find them at work right in the middle of town. There's some sculptures there. Like, not blocks, but you can hang them in places like in trees. And... While young mums are getting back into shape on the beach, others are enjoying one of the many cafes up in town. Although it's midsummer here in New Zealand, it's Christmas Eve. So we're off to a quieter anchorage where we have planned to meet up with family and friends for a Christmas party. Well, the party's over, and it's time to weigh anchor and head to the Coromandel Peninsula and Great Barrier Island, which help form a protective eastern boundary to the Hauraki Gulf. We'll also take a detour over to the beautiful Mercury Islands. The range of hills of the Coromandel Peninsula offers protection from the wind and sea to many protected anchorages on the western coastline. They also trap a lot of rain that comes in from the northeast. Before the arrival of the Europeans, much of New Zealand was covered in dense bush and massive forests of kauri. These trees grew tall and straight and the whalers were the first to load their ships with this wood for spars. Other parts of the world had been stripped of their trees and shipwrights were searching for other sources of good timber. Along with the quantity of wood available, New Zealand also had plenty of protected harbours to establish shipyards. So by the early 1800s, a huge shipbuilding industry had begun here. On Great Barrier Island and Coromandel, the loggers had to find ways to get the timber down the steep and rugged terrain to the ships waiting in the harbours below. They built huge wooden driving dams high up into the hills, some measuring 14 metres high by 40 metres wide. Only when as many logs as possible lay piled in the dry creek beds did they fill the pools above the dams. When tripped, the bursting floodgates created an avalanche, sending logs into the valley below. It's estimated about 3,000 of these dams were built in this area during the 50 years of intensive logging. The remains of only a couple of these dams exist today, and trappers can enjoy some wonderful walking tracks up to these historic places. In just over 100 years, the mainland and most of the outlying islands around the northern part of New Zealand had been stripped of their forests. Once the land was cleared, heavy rainfalls washed silt and soil down into harbours and estuaries throughout Northland. This has had a devastating and permanent effect on many of the once deep harbours, as they are no longer navigable by any deep drafted vessels. Four miles east of Coromandel Peninsula is Great Mercury Island. Farmland has replaced the Kauri forests that once grew here. And boaties come to enjoy its many spectacular anchorages. Lieutenant James Cook, later to become captain, stopped here during his first visit to New Zealand on the Endeavour in November 1769. He came to this bay specifically to observe the transit of Mercury 
He wrote, If we should be fortunate to obtain this observation, the longitude of this place and country will thereby be very accurately determined. From here you can look across Mercury Bay to where Cook anchored and set up an observation point at a place known as Cook's Beach. He did succeed and he went on to claim possession of New Zealand in the name of King George III. When we got back down to the beach, we saw that a pod of bottlenose dolphins had come in really close to shore. Islands are renowned for their abundant scallops, so Lane went diving with friends in about 10 metres of water. They found their quota in no time, so we had plenty to share with friends to celebrate the beginning of another year. Mm. Oh, oh boy! We were having a great time sailing Mai Tai in the steady 25 knots of breeze. And it didn't take us long to sail the 30 nautical miles to Great Barrier Island. This is New Zealand's fourth largest island, after the North, South and Stewart Islands. Great Barrier Island is 40 miles long, 10 miles wide and just 60 nautical miles from downtown Auckland. It is often not until late in the afternoon that you arrive at Great Barrier Island if you've sailed over from anywhere near Auckland. This narrow passage opens into an immense harbour with dozens of bays and coves to choose from to drop your anchor. This was our favourite anchorage in Kiwi Riki Bay, tucked in behind these two islands, looking back out towards the narrow entrance. Last year, in preparation for this voyage down to the southern regions of New Zealand, the addition of this hard dodger with the full canvas enclosure has added a whole new room to Mai Tai. With our two 75 watt solar panels and wind generator, we're able to produce sufficient power to allow us to be completely autonomous. We also have a water maker on board, but on wash day, I prefer to take the dinghy over to a nearby bay where some cruisers have run a water hose down from a stream to some concrete wash basins, installed an old hand wringer to create the ideal cruiser's laundry. Port Fitzroy is the commercial hub of Fitzroy Harbour, where you can find all the necessities for this cruising life. The road from here connects with the two airports to Trifina for the ferry that has a regular service to and from Auckland, or you can simply catch a bus to tour the whole island. The harbours on this western bush clad side of the island offer excellent, well protected anchorages. But on the east coast, the long stretches of white sandy beaches are open to the sea so it's wise to only come over here during settled weather and leave plenty of time to explore this beautiful coastline. Sailing back towards the mainland, Kay and Lane will stop off at Kauau Island, 30 nautical miles from here. Access to Kauau is still possible only by boat as there are no roads on the island. Copper was mined here briefly, but when the operation closed down the remains of the mine and an old rundown manager's house were left behind. 
In 1862, the Governor of New Zealand, Sir George Grey, bought the island and transformed the old house into his dream residence. He imported exotic plants and animals including zebras, emus and monkeys. All have died out except the wallabies and the peacocks, which still roam freely about the park-like grounds. Over on the mainland, large, shallow, mangrove-lined waterways reach far inland. In the mid-1800s, it was here that many of the European immigrants arriving off the ships from Britain were left to start their new life in this new land. At that time, the local government was giving away large parcels of this wasteland to encourage new settlers to New Zealand. The rivers were tidal and muddy and the families had the incredibly difficult task of finding some way to turn this land so thick with dense bush and huge kauri forests into useful farmland. What a shock they must have got when they got off the ship and first set eyes on this beautiful yet unforgiving land. As the kauri trees were highly valued for their timber, the first industries to be established were sawmills and shipyards. There were no roads, so boats were the only form of transport for many years. Many were wrecked along the coast, and some of the larger ones have been restored to be admired by future generations. Rangi River was once busy with these scars, loaded with timber and later cement, setting off to the port of Auckland, 30 miles away. This river is shallow and very tidal, so only navigable at high tide, which happened to be at 6 o'clock on a very still morning the day we came up here to haul out Maitai at a boatyard right next door to the old cement works. The beautiful setting made the months of hard work completely sanding and repainting Mai Tai somewhat more pleasant. The Portland Cement Works, built in 1872, were the first in the Southern Hemisphere and at one time employed 180 men, among them my own grandfather who worked here as an industrial chemist. Pleasure yachts have now taken the place of the old scows that would line up here, loading their cargo of cement to be taken to Auckland for export. At high tide, small boats can sail right up to the township of Walkworth, which grew up as a result of all this industry, and has since become a thriving centre for agriculture, arts and supports the nearby Matakana region. This land that was so painstakingly cleared last century is still being farmed today. Before leaving the Hauraki Gulf, Kay and Lane are going to call in at Goat Island, a small island close to shore, surrounded by New Zealand's first marine reserve. On the bank opposite is the Lee Marine Research Centre which is a part of the University of Auckland, established here in the early 1970s. They've arranged to meet with the director of the laboratory, Professor John Montgomery, to talk about marine reserves and some of the research they're doing. Lee was established as one of the first legally constituted no-take marine reserves anywhere in the world. And now there are, um, say, 31-odd marine reserves in different locations around New Zealand. The reason that the laboratory was set up here is that it's just at the outer end of the Hauraki Gulf, which goes into Auckland Harbour. So we're only an hour out from a, a major city centre, and yet we've got pristine water um, conditions here, open ocean um, impinging on um, a pristine coastline. The purposes of the marine reserves have become a uh, major um, community resource and a, a place that people like to visit simply because of the populations of fish in the area and now so we actually get 300,000 visitors to the beach per year to come and kayak and snorkel and scuba dive from the beach itself 
So that alone is, uh, is really a major justification for the Marine Reserve. The Reserve's been a remarkable success in terms of the regeneration of numbers of charismatic animals in the Reserve space itself. That's in sort of intuitive feel. It's certainly been backed up by the research that's been done at the laboratories. So snapper numbers have recovered dramatically. Uh, rock lobster numbers have recovered dramatically. So one, one of the research programs we've got quite active at the moment is an area of uh, underwater acoustics. For instance, um, both here in a temperate reef, but also in coral reefs, most of the animals spawn their progeny off the reef. They spend time in the plankton feeding, and then to complete their life cycle, they have to return to the reef. And it turns out that sound is, uh, is a very likely cue to enable them to do that. So in, we've done some of this work up at the Great Barrier Reef, and we've found that if you put out artificial reef patches of dead coral, and you look at the settlement of animals into those patches, that you can effectively double the recruitment of um, larval fish into those reefs by the addition of reef sound. So in effect, uh, you can show that the animals are tracking that sound back to the reef again. In some of the recent work we've been doing, at least in temperate areas like here at Lee, the sound is being largely generated by snapping shrimp and sea urchins. Actually, people don't think of sea urchins as creating sound, but their feeding activity and the way their shell resonates at particular frequencies means that they're quite a potent source of um, natural biological sound. Um, and there's a lot of interesting structure as well. There, there are dawn and dusk choruses, a bit like there are birds in the forest. So sea urchins and snapping shrimps um, on summer new moons after the sun's gone down, there's a big chorus of activity there, uh, which actually coincides with the time when a lot of animals are settling on the reef. Situated just 12 miles off the Northland coast are the Poor Knights Islands, another one of New Zealand's 31 marine reserves. The subtropical current that passes through the huge kelp forests and giant caves enables a unique range of fish species to live here. Kay and Lane continue their voyage northwards, towards Northland and the Bay of Islands, where they'll spend time exploring and take a look at some of the colourful historic events that took place there. Mai Tai will now visit Northland, which is sometimes referred to as the winterless north, with its temperate and subtropical climate. Kay and Lane will cruise this beautiful coastline with its dozens of protected anchorages, explore the Bay of Islands and some of the more northern harbours which are all rich in the early history of New Zealand. Their first port of call is the Whangarei Harbour, 60 nautical miles north of Auckland. There are several good safe overnight anchorages tucked in just behind the Whangarei heads. But 10 miles further up the river, past the Marsden Point oil refinery, is Whangarei, a popular stopover for many cruisers visiting New Zealand. Boat yards and ship chandlers are nearby, and the 300 berth marina is situated right in the middle of town. Kay and Lane see a boat across the way inspired insanity, a 28-foot Southern Cross from the United States. We had met Donna Lang in Auckland while she was preparing her boat for the next leg of her solo circumnavigation. We were happy to be able to meet up with this amazing lady once more. When I left Rhode Island, I knew that my plan was to go one stop around the world. I wanted to go out to sea for as long as I could possibly go out, yet at the same time to cross both the capes in one year was too much for me. I would have had to have been too risky. So I said, half a year, I'll do half the world, and then I'll do the other half of the world. And I arrived in New Zealand 168 days later, 
which is uh, the equivalent of five and a half months. Now, a question that people always ask us, I bet you catch lots of fish when you're How <laughs> That's many right. fish do you catch? I know. I'm sitting right behind you. I can see a fishing line all ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. She's all ready to go. The conditions coming on this, the first half of the trip, were out, just extremely challenging. And I was very hard to wind very much the wind was on my nose and it created conditions where fishing just was not an option. While Donna is at sea, she finds inspiration for another passion of hers, music and songwriting. Music is a, a very special uh, medium of exchange and so it's just I think it's one of the most special things of what I'm doing is that given the kind of challenge that I'm in and the desire I had of the kind of learning to do that I'm able to plan that all down into into lyrics and throw some music together with it and then I have a way to share that everywhere I go. Donna successfully rounded Cape Horn and completed her solo circumnavigation when she pulled into New York. Bravo Donna! Leaving the Whangarei Heads, heading north, behind the rocky headlands, you begin to see some of the many beautiful beaches lined with summer holiday cottages. This eastern coastline is exposed to northeast winds and the Pacific Ocean swell, and the narrow entrances to the few protected anchorages can be very hazardous in heavy weather. Mai Tai sails into one of the more protected of these east coast bays called Whangamumu Harbour. Whales were once plentiful around the New Zealand waters and whalers had been hunting here since the beginning of the 19th century. Deep protected harbours were ideal for the installation of shore based whaling stations where boats could bring the whales safely to the shore. Tucked away in the corner of Whangamumu Harbour are the remains of a whaling station which was run by three generations of the Cook family. Each year, during the three-month whaling season, the whole family would leave their nearby farm to come and run the station. Kay and Lane found that some of the family still live nearby. Nairi Clifford, born Nairi Cook, used to come here each year as a young child with her family. Nairi was kind enough to share some of her childhood memories and photos of her time at the station. The whaling station closed down in about 1932 or 33, and you see it was a noisy place and a smelly place. Yes, that's all, and there, that's Dad with his silly hat, that looks like him. Okay. This station was unique for the nets they used. Whalers stretched a cable between the shore and a rock and suspended nets from them. The whales became entangled in the nets, making them easy prey for the harpooner. Today there is a growing awareness of the need to save the world's remaining whales before it's too late. And in New Zealand, whales are protected by the Marine Mammals Protection Act. Mai Tai is now entering the Bay of Islands, famous for the wonderful cruising throughout the dozens of islands and the abundance of delightful safe anchorages. To enter the Bay of Islands from the south, you can sail between Cape Brett and Piercy Island with its famous Hole in the Rock. The eight mile sail from Cape Brett to Opua takes you through one of the most popular cruising and holiday destinations of New Zealand. The townships of Russell, Paihia and Waitangi, rich in both early Māori and European history, have continued to flourish as tourist towns. Opua, situated up in the southeastern corner of the bay, is New Zealand's northernmost customs clearance port. The majority of overseas visitors arriving by yacht will make this their first port of call. Opua is a busy port with moorings in the bay and a modern 240 berth marina with good liveaboard facilities. They have a brand new cruising club, a general store, haul out facilities and in fact almost anything a cruiser may need for their boat. Now a quaint tourist town, Russell, called Kororaraka when it was New Zealand's first capital. 
In those days, it was a town full of bawdy whalers and traders. In fact, it was better known as the Hell Hole of the Pacific. From the early 1800s, whaling ships had begun hunting in the southern oceans. Many of them found safe anchorage in the Bay of Islands, where they were able to refit their vessels. And at times, there would have been a dozen big whaling ships anchored right here in this bay. The crew, a rough and bawdy bunch of men, would go ashore to find the three things they'd missed most during their months of hard and dangerous work at sea. They were desperate for alcohol, women and fresh food. And here at Russell, they could find it all. At one time, there were 24 brothels and 30 flourishing grog shops lining these streets. This beautiful hotel, the Duke of Marlborough, was one of them. In fact, it was the first licensed hotel in New Zealand, built in 1827. The odd whaling pot and whale bone are also reminders of this time. Directly across the bay from Russell was Paihia, where the first missionaries came to build churches and begin to spread the word of Christianity to the local people. And here in Rangihoa Bay, a monument stands where Reverend Samuel Marsden preached his first sermon on Christmas Day in 1814. It was in Waitangi on the 6th of February 1840 that the Treaty of Waitangi, New Zealand's founding document, was signed between Queen Victoria's representatives and some Māori chiefs. By 1880, law and order began to win over in Russell and the message of the missionaries was finally getting through. Law and order did not suit the whalers and they left town. One could spend years cruising the Bay of Islands and still keep finding new places to explore. Diving, fishing, snorkeling and excursions ashore are all there if you tire of hanging about in idyllic anchorages. Leaving Cape Brett 20 miles behind, it's an easy trip up to the Cavalli Islands. Lying just two nautical miles off the coast, in summer, you'll always find lots of pleasure boats and fishermen here. Divers come to look at the Rainbow Warrior, the Greenpeace ship that was sunk by French Secret Service agents during the mid-1980s. Since it was brought here, a rich and unique underwater marine habitat has developed over the wreck to create an interesting dive site. Trampers also make use of the island, staying in the hut belonging to the Department of Conservation. Over on the mainland, opposite the Cavalli Islands, lies another hidden jewel of Northland, the Whangaroa Harbour. It's the most northerly sheltered harbour, almost landlocked, with deep bays within its impressive coastline. Many small vessels make their way back here to shelter from approaching bad weather. On the headland guarding the harbour entrance are reminders that during World War II, American Marines came to New Zealand to help defend our shores from possible Japanese invasion from the north. Tucked discreetly in behind the headland is what was once their military barracks, built in 1942. From here it must have been difficult to comprehend that there was a war going on not far away. This is now a beautiful game fishing resort and tourist lodge where all boats are welcome. You can safely anchor in the bay and pop in for a drink or a meal or simply just a visit. As there is no road access, the lodge will arrange to pick up guests by boat from nearby townships. Arrive as a guest, leave as a friend. What a great motto. The history of Whangaroa Harbour dates back to Kupe, the Polynesian navigator and explorer who landed here from Hawaii and subsequently other Polynesian tribes who arrived by canoe from the north to settle here. 
Whaling ships used to visit the bay. Then, during the 1830s, Europeans began to settle here, establishing townships around their shipbuilding, sawmilling, and trade in kauri gum. The quiet little town of Whangaroa was once a bustling centre of industry. The marina, which has room for 86 boats, is right in the middle of town. Along with the general store, at a couple of places to get a great meal and meet the locals, the Marlin Hotel and the Gamefish Club down on the pier. The beautiful St Paul's Anglican Church built in 1883 and original schoolhouse preside over the village from above. But it is St Paul's Rock which dominates the town and offers an unsurpassed view of the township and harbour. Across the bay lies Totara North, a thriving township back in the 1800s, supporting the huge timber mill and shipbuilding industry. As the timber died out, the timber mill and shipyard fell into disrepair and had to make way for modern roads down to the wharf, which was being used by the large fishing fleet. That activity at the wharf has slowed down over the last 10 years, as the fishing fleet has fallen from 54 boats to a mere 8 working from here nowadays. The harbour beyond Totara North and Whangaroa becomes too shallow for navigating, but it is the perfect place to farm oysters, another huge industry for the area. At low tide, the acres and acres of these farms are revealed at the head of many of the bays. But the oysters seem to grow naturally on every square inch of rock or piling all around the shoreline. And it's very hard not to stop and enjoy these delicacies straight from the sea. Oh, they are fabulous. From the head of Riri Bay, under a rock appropriately named the Duke's Nose, a river runs through a deep fjord where the tuis come to feed on the nectar of the flowering kofi tree. As we were leaving Whangaroa, we saw a local fisherman and personality known as Johnny Longline. Johnny is a member of the Voluntary Coast Guard Service, and on his days off he takes his delightful lady out for some relaxation therapy. These things are poisonous in their spines. Johnny's caught a good-sized sea perch. They're good eating. Ah, oh, then you're really hungry. We're making the most of this weather of steady breezes and calm sunny days as we continue our voyage northwards towards Doubtless Bay. Kay and Lane will wait in Doubtless Bay and visit the township of Monganui until the weather conditions are suitable for them to leave again. Once through the pass, Monganui Harbour runs for about a mile and opens into a wide and largely shoal basin. In the past, this protected harbour has given refuge to the early Polynesians, to hundreds of whaling ships that visited as early as 1792, and later to a large timber and shipbuilding industry. Today, life in this quiet little township of Manganui seems to centre around the wharf and visitors come to dine at the world-famous fish shop. The sky is still overcast, but the weather forecast indicates a good time for Mai Tai to leave for their next destination. This time, they need to get around the top of New Zealand, and they hope to get down as far as Nelson, which could be a four-day sail. But approaching bad weather forces them to change plans. The harbours north of here are shallow with sandbar entrances. But once we get around into the Tasman Sea, there'll be no safe harbours for hundreds of miles. We've just spent the last couple of days waiting in Monganui for the weather to change. There's a high over us now and as the high passes we should get favourable winds to sail down the west coast. We left this morning, we sailed the 45 miles up to North Cape, which we've just rounded. 
We're now sailing 20 miles right across the Cape Reinga and then we'll turn left and head down the west coast, down to Marlborough Sounds and hopefully arrive in Nelson in about three days. Right here, off the top of New Zealand, is where two great bodies of water meet, the Pacific Ocean and the Tasman Sea rolling up from the roaring 40s. Today the conditions are ideal, so with the sail set for the 15 knot warm breeze, the wind vane just needs a minor adjustment from time to time to keep Mai Tai on her course southwards. The wind vane steers a steady course. Meanwhile, Lane can deal with the more important matters on hand. Dinner for the next few days. By the second day, the wind had died completely. But we were beginning to get the feeling that this could be the calm before the storm. There was a cyclone hitting the tropical islands further north and heading southwards very quickly. Outlook, suddenly, four zero knots in the west. While conditions are still calm, we begin to look at our options if this predicted cyclone Furna does hit New Zealand soon. There was one port we could head for, the only deep water harbour on this coast, about a day's sail away, New Plymouth. While on passage, Lane and I take turns to stay on watch in the cockpit for three hours, while the other goes below for three hours of sleep. This routine has always worked well for us. During the night, the conditions got progressively worse, and by morning, New Plymouth was still a few hours sail away. We were desperately hoping to reach there in time to safely tuck in behind the sea wall for protection. If not, we'll have to head back out to sea and ride out the storm there, far away from land. late in the afternoon and by next morning as Cyclone Funa was ravaging the north the heavy seas were pounding the sea walls of Port Taranaki where by now Might I was safely moored and boy were we very thankful to be here. After every storm comes the sunshine, the birds and the tourists. Local personality Chaddy was back taking tourists out for a ride in his beautifully restored English lifeboat to the sound of old sea shanties. Mount Taranaki, surrounded by beautiful rolling farmland, is the easily recognised landmark for the region. And the harbour below, looking much calmer now. The next stretch of water to cross is past the western end of Cook Strait, which can get incredibly rough. The conditions were looking more settled and by nightfall the wind had filled in from behind so Kay and Lane were looking forward to a calm sail right down to Fiordland, four days sailing from here. Fiordland is made up of 14 glacier-carved fjords stretching 100 miles along the southwestern coast of the South Island and reaching far into the steep forested mountains that form part of a 1.2 million hectare national park. Most of Fiordland is a pristine wilderness, 
only accessible by boat that attracts just a handful of cruisers to brave the extreme weather conditions to explore this magnificent region. Lane and I have spent many months preparing ourselves and Mai Tai for this voyage. And keep in mind what weatherman Bob McDavid had to say about cruising Fiordland. Fiordland's not a cruising ground, an adventure ground, yes. Even Cook, Captain Cook, when he went to Fiordland, he said, oh, I don't like this place, it's a lee shore. But once you're into the fjords, magic. You've never seen anything like it. It's a reward for getting there, I suppose. daybreak on the fourth day, the headlands of Milford Sound lay ahead of us. Milford Sound is the northernmost and most accessible of all the fjords, and therefore the most visited by tourists. So we weren't surprised to see other boats and even a cruise liner waiting for the first light to make an entrance. The wind had died, so we put the sails away and watched the cruise ship go in ahead of us. The towering cliffs seemed to almost engulf the ship, which, in fact, helped give us some perspective of the sheer size of these fjords. miles from the entrance to Milford at the head of the Sound. We were barely halfway along and the cruise ship was already heading back out, almost dwarfing the Stirling Falls, which are 146 metres high. The sun was well up by the time we sailed into Deepwater Basin at the head of Milford Sound. Once you get in here, you can arrange to take a pile mooring alongside the local fishing boats, but we chose to anchor out in the bay. Fiordland gets seven metres of annual rainfall. After heavy rains, existing waterfalls turn into raging torrents, and hundreds of new ones appear from nowhere. The Milford Sound has one of the busiest airports in the South Island. During the busy summer months, Milford Sound will host over 3,000 visitors per day. Some just come for the day to kayak or take a boat trip on the fjord, while others will stay in the backpacker's lodge just up the road. There are even some who choose to walk here. Kay and Lane took their dinghy to the Milford track, which ends here in Milford Sound. Of the many stunning walks in Fiordland, the Milford track is probably the most famous of them all. Daily bookings are limited in order to keep control of the number of people on the track at any one time. No camping is allowed and accommodation huts are situated along the way. After a couple of hours walking in from the end, they reached the giant Gate Falls. And by this time, we're meeting the hikers coming the other way. Now at the end of their four-day hike, 54 kilometres from the starting point of the township of Tianao. 
They looked as though they were ready to take the first boat that comes to pick them up and take them to the Mitre Peak Lodge in Milford. The hikers are then taken back to their starting point in Tiana. All the huts along the walking track are serviced by helicopter. At the beginning and end of each season, supplies are flown in and the waste removed to keep the area pristine. Of the 31 marine reserves in New Zealand, 10 of them border the Fiordland National Park. The underwater observatory in Harrison Cove, within Milford Sound, has been established to allow visitors to come and learn about the uniqueness of this area. What makes Fiordland unique? It's largely due to the heavy rain that washes through the leaf litter on the forest floors and becomes a dark tea-stained colour. This dark-stained fresh water runs into the fjords and floats on top of the heavier seawater. This causes a reduction in light, which fools some unusual deep water species to make their habitat in shallower waters. The staff explain about the unique corals and fish life that are found in the fjords. This one here is probably around about uh, 50, 60 years old. They do grow to three to four metres across and many centuries old by the time they get to that sort of size. Deepwater Basin in Milford Sound is used as a base for both lobster and tuna fishing fleets. Recreational fishing is restricted in many areas of Fiordland, but the tuna fishing boats based here come in after several days at sea to unload their catch of albacore tuna. The nearest store to Milford is the township of Tiarnau, 120 kilometres away over the Southern Alps. This will be the last opportunity to shop for at least a month or until they arrive in Stewart Island. So after a bus trip to buy last minute fresh goods and the fuel tank topped up, Mai Tai is ready to leave Milford and head south. Although the distance between the fjords may only be around 15 to 20 miles, the time to get from one anchorage at the head of one sound to the anchorage at the head of the next will often more than double this distance. Looking Glass Bay is one of only a few places you can stop between fjords. In calm, settled conditions, it is possible to anchor overnight, or you can take the time to stop off for a quick dive to pick up the evening meal. Cruising guides are invaluable in describing each of the anchorages throughout the fjords, but it is still a good idea to get to your chosen destination early enough in the day and take time to ensure a secure mooring and possibly get to meet some of the local fishermen. What a gorgeous little cove we've got here. This is called Alice Falls and Alice Lake is up on the ridge up there. We we'll just ease in here and watching the depth and 16 meters here, very close to the uh, rocky bank. This gives an idea of how these fjords are deep right up to the shoreline. Most of the recognized anchorages have permanently buoyed stern lines to which you attach yourself after anchoring. It's really important to get this right, as although an anchorage is sheltered from the sea, violent gusts of wind can come blasting the area from any direction. It's thanks to the commercial fishermen who find refuge in many of these bays that there are stern lines already tied to the shore or across a narrow bay. Visiting boats can use these lines, and sometimes it'll be necessary to raft up with another boat if someone is there before you. Also, you need to remember that if a fishing boat comes in and you're on his mooring line, then he may just come and tie up alongside as well. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
These fishermen often have to take shelter from bad weather for long periods, so have installed a few home comforts around the shore. Sunrise in the fjords is worth getting up for. But we also like to get an early start so that we can sail the outside stretches of water before the wind comes up late morning, which can really churn up the sea. The other thing about arriving early is that you have time to fish. You catch mostly blue cod, which are such voracious predators. They'll eat anything, so are quick to take a baited hook. Just our kind of fishing. With an abundance of fresh fish and the delicious aroma of hot bread straight from the oven, even these grey overcast days seem wonderfully magical. Because of the rugged terrain, excursions ashore are few. You also need to be comfortable leaving your boat at anchor unattended while ashore. The anchorage at Gear Arm, at the head of Bradshaw Sound, allows you to safely leave your boat to go exploring the Camelot River. Doubtful Sound is the deepest and second longest of all the fjords, being 22 miles long and reaches a depth of 420 metres. This is the only fjord, apart from Milford, where there's road access. Local fishing boats come in from the sea and use this as their base. Tourists can be dropped off to pick up kayaks or take a trip on one of the charter boats for a one day or an overnight cruise. Helicopters are also a useful and spectacular way to arrive here. Helicopters are also essential for the cray fishermen, fishermen and hunters who sometimes stay around here for weeks on end. Rather than clearing bush to build huts ashore, landing pads are situated around the bays for helicopters to come in for any emergency or to transport supplies and cargo in and out of these remote areas. There's no cell phone coverage throughout the whole of Fiordland. Satellite reception can be intermittent, so VHF and SSB radios are the main link to the outside world, mainly through Mary Lesk of Bluff Fisherman's Radio. Good evening, this is Bluff Fisherman's Radio, standing by VHF channel 16, 61, 63... Mary is on duty 24-7 listening for calls from vessels and runs a twice daily sked with current weather and roll call, tucking everybody in at night. Very well, thank you. We're still in little glory. But Despite the number of tour boats, Doubtful Sound is so extensive that you can still find a perfectly peaceful mooring, far up into the many arms and seldom see another boat.
These families of bottlenose dolphins, the adults measuring about two to three meters in length, live up here in Crooked Arm. Synonymous with Fiordland are the words rain and sandflies. In addition to the use of insect repellents, effective screens over every opening help make our stay much more enjoyable. We were also thankful to have made these hats to wear for working out on deck, and particularly whenever we went ashore, where the sandflies become unbearable. At the head of this cove in Doubtful Sound, we walked over a one kilometre track that links with the head of Dag Sound. It was obvious that not too many people passed by here and the orange trail markers were helpful for finding our way back out of this bush. Dusky Sound is the most extensive and the longest fjord in Fiordland, nearly 24 nautical miles long. An inner passage connects Breaksea Sound to Dusky Sound. This Acheron Passage is 10 miles long and when the wind whips up you can enjoy a great sail between the sounds. Captain Cook sighted and named Dusky Bay on his first voyage with the Endeavour, but could not make the entrance before dark, so sailed on. When he returned three years later in the Resolution, he sailed her through this narrow gap, scarcely twice the width of the ship. One wonders how they managed such precise navigation in these enclosed areas under sail power alone. The ship spent five weeks in what is now known as Pickersgill Harbour. Mai Tai anchored in roughly the same spot as the Resolution and imagined that this was the same branch that reached out to the gunnels on the Resolution. Travelling with Cook on the Resolution was an astronomer, a representative of the British Board of Longitude. His mission was to establish an observatory in order to check the accuracy of the newly invented ship's chronometer and compare it with the fix from celestial observations. The point is now called Astronomer's Point and a boardwalk leads to a survey peg marking this historical spot. Captain Cook went on to explore and chart much of Dusky Sound at this time. West Cape, which lies between Dusky and Chalky Sounds, is the remotest part of Fiordland. Yet it was Chalky and Preservation Inlets, the southernmost of all the fjords, that saw the largest number of early settlements in the area. Sealers arrived and had soon decimated the huge colonies of fur seals that once crowded on exposed rocky areas all around the southern coastline. But it was the discovery of gold around 1868 that brought most of the settlers to Preservation Inlet. This is the site where the township of Cromarty once stood, 
and at one time had a hotel, two boarding houses, three shops and a school. Bush has reclaimed the land where the town once stood, but scattered around the hills behind lie many relics of the gold and sawmilling days. There were as many as 500 people living in Preservation Inlet by the 1890s. They even mined silver for a short time. The Tarawera Silver Mine, built in 1911 in Isthmus Sound, is unique for this chimney built reclining into the bank. It's 18 metres long and 1 metre in diameter. All this activity here lasted less than two decades. Mai Tai must now plan on sailing around Pusica Point, the most isolated and gale-torn lighthouse point in New Zealand. Pusica Point. It gets gales like, like there's no tomorrow. It can go for a whole month, but only have one non-gale day there. You only need maybe 10 to 15 knots blowing across the Tasman Sea, hitting the Southern Alps, piles up on itself and squeezes around the southwest end of the South Island, Pusica Point. Stewart Island lies 70 miles to the southeast. Kay and Lane will need to sail past Pusica Point, across Fobo Strait, and then along the extremely rough and rugged coastline of Stewart Island, with many outlying rocky islands to go right around the very southern end of Stewart Island, as far as Port Pegasus. We left on a day with winds blowing 35 knots, but at least they were blowing from the north and the seas were heavy but manageable. Stories spring to mind of other yachts having attempted this passage three and four times before being able to pass. Stories of unexpected gales and huge breaking seas and shipwrecks. We've been keeping an eye on a cruise ship which appears to be on collision course with Mai Tai. The ship alters course to pass astern. There'll be little rest for the crew now as they sail right through the night in order to make landfall in the morning. Stewart Island, Rakiura, which lies between 46 and 48 degrees south, is the third largest island in New Zealand. Lane and Kay are now going to explore the east coast of this remote and unspoiled island, before crossing back over Fovo Strait to the fishing port of Bluff. They will then sail to the city of Dunedin, 140 miles further north. Our first glimpse of Stewart Island was a very bleak and windswept coastline. We were just rounding the southernmost tip of New Zealand, South Cape, and we still have 20 miles to sail before we arrive in Port Pegasus. In August 1809, the ship Pegasus sailed into this harbour, now known as Port Pegasus, and the island named after Mr Stewart, a cartographer on board the ship. The weather changes can be dramatic, and many of the anchorages are small and shallow, so the use of a stern line is often recommended, especially if you want to leave the boat to take one of the many wonderful hikes around the island. We joined another couple of cruisers taking our dinghies to the head of a small river, to the beginning of a walking track to Bald Cone. Bald Cone is a remarkable granite peak, 275 metres high and the tramping time to the top is about two hours where the rope assisted climb to access those last few metres to the top.
Port Pegasus stretches eight miles from north to south. Southerly gales blow through here, but the Southern Ocean swells are blocked by this narrow stretch of land. Looking northward are the Tin Range Mountains, 637 metres high, and the Rakiura National Park, which covers 85% of the island. Over on the west coast is one of the group of islands that makes up the Muttonbird Islands, so named for the Titi, or mutton birds, which are a specialty of Stewart Island. This west coast is very rugged and there are very few places for boats to take shelter. Moving from South Arm up to North Arm of Port Pegasus, you can look back to see the Fraser Peaks with the mountains of Gog and Magog, to which there is another great day's hike. In fact, there are many walks covering much of Stewart Island. And this is one of the only places you can see kiwi during the day. what remains of an old tin mining settlement where a post office store and hotel once stood. Deer hunters, hikers and the occasional sailboat still visit the area and come to admire the nearby Bell Topper Falls. We finally found this narrow passage into Smuggler's Cove. Once inside, there were no chests of gold, but instead we discovered one of Stewart Island's natural treasures. Shags look on while a fur seal hunts nearby. The New Zealand fur seal was highly prized in the beginning of the 1800s by both the Chinese and British markets for their oil and for their skins. With numbers diminishing in other parts of the world, sealing gangs began to head south in search of new supplies. They risked their lives in the treacherous freezing waters around the rugged southern coastline as they came ashore in small open boats to hunt. They built huts and often stayed several months, curing the skins while waiting for the parent ship to return to pick them up. Cargoes of tens of thousands of skins were not uncommon. were also hunted, but they were not as valuable as the fur seal. Fishing is easy throughout all of Stewart Island, and it's usually blue cod or the odd scarpie that takes the hook. 
The east coast of Stewart Island has several safe harbours and the anchorages are all well documented in the cruising guides. It was in Port Adventure where they met up with the crew of this yacht, resting after their voyage to the Campbell Islands far down in the Southern Ocean. The pristine white beaches lining the deep inlets with names like Abraham's Bosom, Sailor's Rest and Twilight Cove tell us that these have always been safe havens for the men of the sea. When sailing in these latitudes, we watch the weather very carefully as the sea and wind conditions can change almost without warning. We also had to keep a constant lookout for fishing buoys set along the coast. As well as fishing boats stopping to clear their nets. Hundreds of birds including mollymawks, petrels, shearwaters and gulls all come to share the spoils. We even saw wandering albatross and royal albatross joining in. The albatross are amongst the largest of flying birds, with a wingspan reaching over three metres. Mai Tai sails northward towards Patterson Inlet, a large harbour which saw a lot of the early settlement of Stewart Island. Old relics can still be found on one of the beaches where Norwegian whalers came to repair and service their ships during the 1920s. But despite this tranquil appearance, ferocious winds often come funnelling through this inlet. But at sunrise on a calm morning, Stewart Island lives up to its Māori name, Rakiura, the island of glowing skies. Oban in Half Moon Bay is the only populated area of Stewart Island with a population of almost 400. It's a base for anyone requiring stores and fuel or linking up with an island excursion. Stewart Island's link to the mainland, 20 miles to the north, is either by a small plane or a one-hour ferry trip between here and Oban and Bluff. It's from here that Kay and Lane will leave Stewart Island, stopping in at Bluff before sailing up the rugged, storm-swept coastline past Nugget Point to their next stopover, Dunedin, 140 miles away. Even the Bluff Harbour entrance is full of potential hazards and although the channel is well marked, it's best not to enter here at night or without good local knowledge. Cruising yachts are made welcome in Bluff, but the docking facilities cater primarily for the large fishing fleet that uses this as their base. The windblown township of Bluff has a population of about 2,000 and is probably most well known for the world famous Bluff Oysters. Kay and Lane didn't stop to taste any as they were keen to continue their voyage northwards. Wow that water's cold. That's a 
the taste of the Southern Ocean. Sailing with just triple reefed main, we prepare ourselves for an uncomfortable overnight passage to Dunedin. Southerly 40 knots with very rough sea. Easing 30 knots Sunday afternoon. Well, that was a pretty wild passage last night. But we arrived safely at the Otago Harbour entrance early this morning. Permission is required from the Otago Harbour Board to enter here due to the amount of ship traffic to and from Port Chalmers, six miles up this narrow tidal channel. Around the time of the gold rush in Otago in the 1860s, Port Chalmers became the third largest port in Australasia, after Sydney and Melbourne. Wool, frozen lamb and timber were major exports. Next to the port is Carries Bay, where some visiting boats choose to stop over. While others choose to continue five miles further up the channel to the Otago Yacht Club, which is just a ten minute walk from Dunedin City. It is possible to haul out here for any repairs or maintenance. It's also a safe place to leave the boat if you wish to tour around Otago and Southland, an area rich in the early history of New Zealand. Looking back down the 11-mile channel over Port Chalmers towards the Otago Peninsula, you can see how the university city of Dunedin sprawls out from the head of the harbour. Along the coast south of Dunedin, this Nugget Point lighthouse serves as a reminder to sailors to stay well clear of these rocks called the Nuggets. Long stretches of exposed white sandy beaches line much of the South Island's east coast. Holiday parks and small fishing ports nestle in wherever possible. But most of these bays have difficult entrances and are too shallow for deep drafted vessels. But when the weather is right, Cayenne Lane will leave Dunedin and sail directly to the township of Akaroa. Akaroa lies at the head of an old volcanic crater on Banks Peninsula and enjoys a unique slice of New Zealand's history of its early settlers. In 1838, a French whaling captain, Jean Longlois, after having visited Akaroa, thought this would be an ideal place to claim as a South Pacific French territory. He paid a meagre deposit to the local Māori for its purchase and went back to France in search of a shipload of new immigrants. When he got back to New Zealand two years later, the Treaty of Waitangi had just been signed and the British had planted their flag in Akaroa just five days previously. The French stayed on anyway, implanting a distinctly French atmosphere of which the descendants are very proud. The Sailor V Ambiance is what the hundreds of visitors who come here each year are looking for. The quaint township offers accommodation, shops and sidewalk cafes. The perfect place to wait until the next southerly wind comes to blow the sailors northward again. This time they wait to sail up as far as Port Underwood, 200 miles away along a coast where there are no safe harbours to find shelter. The weather report sounded good, so this seemed like the perfect day to leave. But at these latitudes we're always prepared for anything over a 200 mile passage. We were really having a great sail along with the hundreds of mollymorks. But by evening ominous looking dark clouds were beginning to build up on the horizon. Once again, we remember Bob McDavitt's words of warning. The fronts behave differently east of the mountains. Then finally when the front hits, bang, the rain starts. And that's when you get the real wind. 
the southerlies, in the coldness, in the rain, all at once. Well, Bob wasn't wrong. Mai Tai was hit and battered by squalls for the next 40 hours, all the way to Port Underwood. We were so thankful for our radar chart plotter up in the protection of the hard dodger as we approached land in these squally conditions. After a very wet passage, Port Underwood turned out to be the perfect place to dry out and get some rest while waiting for the ideal winds and tides to continue on to Cook Strait. Kay and Lane will now sail up Cook Strait as far as Tory Channel to enter the beautiful Marlborough Sounds. After exploring this labyrinth of waterways, they'll stop at Derville Island before sailing over to Golden Bay and the Abel Tasman National Park. They'll end this voyage of discovery in the city of Nelson. It was freezing cold the morning we left Port Underwood and we could see a light dusting of snow on the mountains. Winter was on its way. We had studied the weather and tide charts carefully before attempting this passage. It's notorious for the very strong tidal flow and this, combined with heavy seas that funnel through Cook Strait, reports of seven metre breaking seas are not uncommon here. Tory Channel is very busy as it's the shortest route for the ferry service between Wellington and Picton, the link between the North and South Islands. Over on the far shore is where whaler Captain Jackie Gard established one of New Zealand's first whaling stations and later to become the site of the first township in the South Island. Captain Cook first arrived in Queen Charlotte's Sound in the Endeavour in 1770. He chose this bay to use as his base for several weeks during each of his three visits to New Zealand. It seemed to be the perfect place for him and his crew to careen the vessel in the protected bay, repair spars with the plentiful wood ashore and have ample fresh water from the stream nearby. Now named Ship's Cove, a monument has been erected in his honour. Of all the Marlborough Sounds, the Queen Charlotte Sound is the most populated and busiest of all. There are two marinas, with a total of over 800 berths, offering excellent facilities and visiting yachts are welcome. Some of the homes around the foreshore have road access, but there are many places and some lodges throughout all of the sounds that are only accessible by boat, so have their own private dock at the bottom of the garden. If you are a guest at a private retreat, you may be picked up from Picton and whizzed across the bay to your awaiting hosts, then left to enjoy the peaceful surroundings. We took a walk up to the Queen Charlotte walking track, which runs along the narrow stretch of land behind these homes. From the top, we could look over into Kenny Puru Sound, right into the bay where we were headed for next. But by sea, this is 60 miles away around small islands and through a maze of inlets and deep bays. Sailing in the sounds can be quite challenging as strong gusty winds can funnel through the surrounding hills and valleys from all directions. Tranquil bays and anchorages are also affected by these changeable winds. The waters are deep and the cruising guides recommend the use of a stern line to shore when anchoring. 
Kay and Lane have become members of the Peloras Yacht Club, so they could make use of the many club moorings throughout the sounds. The farming of New Zealand's green-lipped mussel is the major industry of the Marlborough Sounds. The farms are made up of long backbone lines. Floats are attached to these lines to support droppers on which the mussels grow, and each line can produce about 25 tonnes of mussels. When harvested, the mussels are removed from the droppers, cleaned and separated. They are then graded and put into bags, each bag weighing one tonne. These are then loaded onto trucks or taken by barge to the processing plant in Havelock. Well, of course we couldn't pass by here without a meal straight from the sea. Here prepared in a wine and cream sauce and served with a bottle of local Sauvignon Blanc. It's now time to leave the Marlborough Sounds to explore Tasman and Golden Bays. They need to get around Derville Island, either through the shortcut at French Pass, or sail around the top of the island through Stevens Passage. The French captain Dumont d'Urville charted and named much of this area in 1827. He was convinced he could navigate his ship, the Astrolab, through this hazardous passage full of incredibly violent whirlpools. The strong current swept his ship almost onto the reef, but a sudden wind change filled their sails to blow them clear to prove this was indeed a navigable passage, now known as French Pass. Kay and Lane decided to sail around the top of the island through Stevens Passage. Even here, the tidal whirlpools and eddies can become treacherous when gale force winds blow through Cook Strait. But today was calm and they were soon safely through into Tasman Bay. They could clearly see the Abel Tasman National Park and Golden Bay 30 miles away. But first, Kay and Lane want to explore the western harbours of Derville Island. The very protected harbours of Port Hardy and Greville Harbour are popular destinations for the boaties based in Nelson, just a day's sail away. Kay and Lane took their dinghy around the bays and back out to the natural boulder bank, which lies across the entrance to Greville Harbour, leaving only a narrow passage at one end for boats to pass. The tidal flow is very strong as all the water movement in and out of this large harbour must pass through this narrow entrance. Early next morning we weighed anchor to find not a breath of wind to help push us the 30 miles towards Golden Bay. We will leave Maitai in the small fishing port of Tarakoi Harbour while we visit the Golden Bay region. Golden Bay was not named for the beaches of golden sand or for the lovely golden sunsets. It was the large quantity of gold that was found in the rivers here during the 19th century from which it took its name. During the peak of the gold rush, excitement grew and plans were being drawn up for this quiet township of Collingwood to become New Zealand's capital city. Today, guided tours leave from here to visit Farewell Spit. This whole area is a nature reserve and public access is restricted to guided four-wheel drive tours. A rough dirt track emerges into a huge expanse of beach, which you can drive along right out to the end of this unique area where birds and colonies of seals can live freely.
This sand spit, 35 kilometers long, is a constantly changing landscape, shaped by wind and water. This sand has been deposited here over millions of years by suspended sediment that's been washed into the sea from the Southern Alps and carried northward by the Westland Current. When the Westland Current meets the Cook Strait Current, the fine sand is deposited on Farewell Spit, which at present is growing about 4 metres per year. The trees around the lighthouse at the end of the spit were planted by the first lighthouse keeper back in 1870. He carried loads of soil in his saddlebags in which to plant the young trees. Now 140 years later, the trees are almost taller than the lighthouse. Looking back over Golden Bay towards the mountains, you become acutely aware of the remoteness of this unique place. On the drive back, you can visit Cape Farewell at the northwestern tip of the South Island. Back on board Baitai, Kay and Lane will make one more stop before arriving in Nelson. Torrent Bay is one of the many protected anchorages bordering the Abel Tasman National Park. A part of the 51 km Abel Tasman walking track passes out onto the golden sandy beach. Kay and Lane have to motor 25 miles along the coast, all the way to Nelson, one of the sunniest cities in New Zealand. The narrow entrance into Nelson Harbour services the large port and the 450 boat marina, which is a popular stopover for cruisers from all around the world. The sunshine brings them here, and the proximity of the marina to the city centre, just a 10 minute walk away along the picturesque Mai Tai River. In the nearby hills there are many interesting walks, and the colourful Saturday market attracts both locals and visitors. They say that much of the pleasure of hanging around in Nelson is what lies on its doorstep. Winter ski fields and the Nelson Lakes are just a 90 minute drive away. The Nelson region is a large fruit growing area and along with Marlborough is internationally renowned for their excellent wines. We decided a fitting way to celebrate the end of a wonderful voyage would be a visit to one of the local vineyards. Judy and Tim Finn established one of the first vineyards in the Nelson region. About 30 years ago this month we started planting grapes out here. In those days there really wasn't much of a wine industry in New Zealand as such. Everybody was trialling everything, Nobody, there was nothing with a proven record. And you, you, know, you look back at the French, you might have taken you know, hundreds of years to perfect which grape is going to do so well in which micro climate or micro region. New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc has got this extraordinary flavour profile. On your 2007 Sauvignon Blanc they're described as highly atmospheric and they're proud of its sexy, fresh sweat and wild herb aromatics. <laughs> <laughs> to intrigue somebody to say, what does that taste like? Does it make you want to drink a glass of it? When you're talking about wine descriptors with people, what we're trying to do is to communicate a taste to them. But it's an, it's an attempt to find a, uh, a, a way to communicate what we're both tasting at the same time. It doesn't taste of blueberries, but that's a hint of blueberries mm. coming in. So you're talking about so things like, in Sauvignon Blanc we're talking about gooseberries. It might smell of gooseberries or passion fruit. So with your wines, how well do they keep? Are they good cellar wines? Any good wine, any well-made wine, will sell us three to five years. Yeah. Probably wouldn't be much good on boats, though, would they, getting tossed around? Well, interesting <laughs> enough, you know, the old days they used to use wine as ballast in boats. Yeah. So that, and they found that wine aged faster being taken from Europe around the globe to London than it did being sent across the channel. 
We are not sure that we will put this theory to the test, but we look forward to continuing our voyage and welcome you back with us on board Mai Tai.